And you've got to remember, step back from all of the uh, headiness of the debate around things like uh, autonomy, particularly things like formal autonomy, and engage bioethics where it's happening in healthcare institutions. Uh, if you read discussions of end of life care, if you read discussions about judgments of futility, these discussions are, are shaped by wanting to be respectful of the preferences of those patients or their values and attitudes. And so we're starting to see convergence here in a way that's actually really, really mm -hmm. exciting. So to resist this pressure <coughs> flirts with incoherence within the relevant sciences because what I'm doing here, what people like Laurie Marino and Steve Weiss are doing are using the sciences to actually show the burgeoning knowledge we have of the relevant psychological capacities of the relevant animals. Uh, to ignore that is to actually dismiss the value of that science, if nothing else. Also within a context of animal welfare where they actually purport to be um, um, framing their work in terms of humane experimentation, that stretches credulity if they're ignoring the preferences, express preferences of the animal research subjects. And the arbitrariness comes again from the failure of anthropocentric speciesism uh, to provide uh, a wall between us and uh, other than human animals. Um, it has been explicitly noticed in this, uh, noted in the scientific literature that uh, other than human animals cannot consent to being used in, in animal research. The Weatherall Report uh, came out sponsored in part by the Wellcome Trust and the Royal Society is one of those reports that, that make this claim. They conclude then that simply because an animal hasn't consented to research uh, uh, doesn't cause them a problem because of course they can't and so of course they haven't. Uh, but that's not, that's not the end of the discussion so let's grant that claim. Okay, so uh, chimpanzees can't, uh, can't actually uh, consent or give their informed consent to research. We can actually uh, make this uh, stronger camp plan by using pediatric research ethics to actually make the claim that they can't assent either, and I'll explain assent in a certain second, mm -hmm. but that, or in, a, in a second, but that doesn't actually uh, stop the, uh, the problem uh, either. Uh, so let me actually uh, introduce you to this third level of decisional uh, authority or capacity in pediatric research ethics, dissent. It contrasts with informed consent, which has to do with understanding that it is research, not therapy, understanding the risks, understanding you can withdraw at any time. Um, that's the sort of thing that involves informed consent. Assent, which tends to, in pediatric research ethics, apply to, to mature minors between the ages of roughly seven and 14, has to do with explaining the research to, their, uh, to, to them in a way that they understand. So they understand also some of the discomfort that they might experience, as well as the value it has for their patient population. Um, and so let's imagine that chimpanzees can't assent either. We need to ask the question, well, um, what do we need for descent? And this is for children in pediatric research ethics that aren't mature, right, who aren't even uh, even children between the uh, ages of 7 and 14, these are, these are subjects that are, are below 7 years old. Um, here's, here's what you need for descent in those contexts. Um, you need to actually uh, be able to experience harm, stress, and distress. You need to be able to be aware uh, of it happening and some of the causal circumstances that bring it, out, that bring it about and have the capacity to express that it stops. Right, those are the, the three kinds of capacities uh, that we would uh, expect. Though it is a controversial concept, particularly <coughs> when parents are involved, uh, it's important for protecting uh, the interests of a very young population of these <coughs> subjects who are incredibly vulnerable. Uh, I'm not denying also that there aren't uh, dissimilarities between the pediatric research population of subjects and chimpanzees, but within a context where we're talking about uh, the um, failure of anthropocentric speciesism and taking seriously scientists claiming that they want to actually engage in humane experimental science, we get to actually suggest, well, there is this construct uh, that chimpanzees uh, seem to uh, meet because they can experience pain, distress, and stress. And for those of you wondering about the skepticism of this, this isn't an area of skeptical doubt mm -hmm. among the, the researchers that use chimpanzees. I have yet to see that expressed by those who work with these eggs. Right. They don't. They don't deny that they can experience distress and harm. Um, they're actually. They can actually be aware of and understand some of the causal conditions. This is what causes trauma that uh, expresses behavioral atypicalities in this research population. Again, 
primate researchers that use these animals in their protocols are well aware of the trauma that's, that's caused. Think of Harry Harlow, a person that actually went about um, ex ex experimentally bringing about trauma in his macaque research population. Again, no doubt that this, this is uh, happening and that they express um, desires or preferences not to be a part of that set of events by trying to escape in their cages, by, by screaming, right? by huddling in, in the corner of the cages, by spitting, right? throwing feces. This is all a part of what the scientists are well aware of as expressions of dissent. So imagine, imagine a world where we take this seriously. Imagine we're talking to a number of scientists, I know some, who want to take dissent much more seriously than is currently on the cards. What would be a world uh, where we do this? Well, in such a world, as in pediatric research ethics, if the chimpanzee dissents, it may actually terminate their inclusion in the, in the research. Right? I say may because we have to consider these. It's the same thing in pediatric research ethics. It's working on most of this list. So if when presenting no more than slightly greater than minimal risk, the study benefits other relevantly, chimpa relevantly similar chimpanzees, we might want to still include them even though they're dissenting. If where the study presents minimal risk, the study could yield important and generalizable knowledge about the chimpanzees. Whether the resistance can be overcome with positive reinforcement training. And whether, the re whether when responsive to PRT, the research places the chimpanzee at long-term risk of serious physical or psychological harms. Think of HIV research, hepatitis C research. Uh, uh, Gracia uh, has a number of these discussions in his place too, but I, I take these particularly from pediatric research ethics. Uh, it will also be important not to destroy this capacity. In a, in a context where this becomes morally significant, it is also significant not to act in a way to destroy it. Because simply because they cannot now dissent because you destroyed the capacity doesn't mean the discussion uh, is over. In fact, it's inconsistent with an appeal or, or sorry, in, inconsistent with an ethical framework that respects uh, this uh, capacity. And just like in a pediatric research context, you don't get to assume the green light until you actually have them reacquire that capacity. So that calls for some kind of intervention and rehabilitation. Um, in a context where they, where they have lost this capacity, and we're thinking about those questions I gave you about um, uh, whether the, the science is still actually useful. We can think of uh, surrogates that can step in and decide to keep them enrolled, thank you, but only if it's in their best interest. Again, think in terms of uh, pediatric uh, research uh, context. <coughs> research conditions, and this is one of the most important points to make in this kind of uh, conceptual uh, framework or ethical framework uh, for scientists working with, with this kind of uh, uh, framework in, in situ you need to actually be very careful to make sure that the conditions of the protocols don't destroy the capacity that you're watching for when you actually keep these animals in participating in this research. The reason why that's most important is Jane Goodall and Michael Balls are on record making the claim that there are no captive contexts in which chimpanzees can grow. Now, Imagine we don't buy that there literally are no captive contacts. Maybe Max Ozawa has actually discovered that. One of the reasons why I raised that question to Flory. Uh, maybe there are others like Yerkes where those adult chimpanzees are doing quite frankly into walls work uh, with, those, with those adults and uh, sub-adults in uh, Yerkes. The question still needs to arise, what, what conditions will destroy this capacity? Those conditions are off bounds for including these animals uh, in, this, in this research. Benefit arguments will lose their punch in this context. So here's a, an example of a benefit argument. I don't need to actually run through the premises and conclusion. You're all familiar with this, I'm sure. It's just I use this to teach students the benefit argument for the use of animals in, in science. Uh, notice that it's anthropos it depends on an anthropocentric speciesism that is a devaluing of all non human animals to actually make this possible for, for their use with uh, humans. If you, if you actually uh, look at benefit arguments used by philosophers where they don't assume an anthropocentric speciesism, R.G. Fry stuff is where you will, he will advocate the use of humans. Mm -hmm. And it's not an academic claim. Mm -hmm. He will advocate the use of humans. The best animal model of human diseases are humans. Yeah. And so in that context, guess what? Right. Now if you think of that as, a, as an ethical step backwards, as I do, uh, this is a reason not to go in that direction, but in the other. Here's, here's, a, here's a, another way to actually uh, then uh, put this. 
uh, when you think of trapdoor clauses, let me finish with the trapdoor clause because I know I'm running out of time. Trapdoor clauses are the clauses you see in Europe, uh, the clauses you've seen advocated by a Scientific America in their editorial to call to, for the end for, of chimpanzee research, was unless there's something serious that happens, some kind of public health crisis where that pandemic can only be modeled in chimpanzees. That's, that's the kind of trapdoor clause I have in mind. That doesn't take seriously, asking chimpanzees for their, or testing them for dissent, taking their agency seriously and including them in those protocols. It doesn't take seriously their dissent when we're actually using them in those protocols. Again, with a reminder that anthropocentric speciesism has failed in this context. And so these trapdoor clauses do not ethically permit the reintroduction of chimpanzees that are dissenting and are morally significantly dissenting from inclusion in the relevant research. <coughs> and that's it. Uh, thank you. And there's a, a, a small <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. reducing the dissent of human being in control as being morally on par with reducing the resistance of a chimpanzee control. In other words, if I could just finish my question, sure. it seems to me that dissent is what Sellers would say is in the space of reasons. Right. Whereas resistance is something else, something maybe behavioral. Well mm -hmm. here, here let me let me say why I disagree. Um, we do actually do this in pediatric research ethics. So one of the ways to actually get beyond uh, very young children's fear of things like MRI machines is to place them in them. Or to actually place them in replicas of them and reward them in that context for not freaking out. That is positive reinforcement training. And so we actually do it, and we do it morally. And they're very young children, and so the claim that this forms reasons for, as long as you include them, I don't see why it's invested in But there's consent for that training, isn't there? Consent for what training? The training to get the children to not fear the... Uh, well, I mean, you need to step back there. If you're talking about very young ch uh, children, no, not from the child, not well, even, not even right. asset, right? Sure. And so that then plugs back into this, right? Then you actually have pediatric research ethics as a very useful ethical frame for mm -hmm. exactly this question of the chimpanzees. And so when you go back to PRT with the chimpanzees, you need to ask questions about things like respectful treatment, uh, best interests of the chimpanzees as well, just like you would with the pediatric uh, patient. Um, I just follow up one sure. more. If you would use a surrogate for the child, which is a minor, uh, in order to make decisions good, why couldn't you use a surrogate for the chimpanzee to make decisions good? Instead of trying to think about what um, we might do to train it to get it to do what we want. Uh, partly because these animals are agents within the context, as I said, with the collapse of anthropocentric speciesism, the recognition in animal welfare that their agency really does matter and that they need to be attuned to their agency. This is a commitment within uh, the, the uh, environment of humane experimental research, all of that comes to the importance of dissent. I mean, you gotta remember, I mean, I presented this in front of a room full of neuroscientists and did not get any kind of dissent from the claim that their dissent will matter within a ethically re-envisioned space because lots of their agency does already matter for animal welfare protocols. And so if they're gonna get passed through an animal care committee in Canada or an AI cook in the United States, it has to actually, pass uh, scrutiny for things like for primates, <coughs> primate psychological well-being. Right? And so within a context where you take agency seriously for that kind of enrichment that keeps them healthy in, in the, the captive environment, dissent comes up as a logical extension and quite natural extension of what's already on the cards for the designers. Just so I understand, yeah. um, humane experimental research is on chimpanzees. Yeah. Um, first of all, is that for their good or aren't they being used for some purpose in which, in other words, the child resistance is in a right. situation, a medical situation where right. what is being done to the child is for that child's own good. Right. If the chimpanzee is in a situation where they're being used right. to achieve something else where they're just an instrument. Yep. Secondly, when you talk about training chimpanzees to accept 
uh, of harmful uh, treatment of them mm -hmm. or distressing or whatever, yeah. uh, what would that training, for example, consist of? If you could give an example or Sure, two. sure. Mm -hmm. So for the first question, you've got to remember this is a re-envisioned space. So of course, I mean, as Stephen has said about his own legal actions, th this is a new space in which to actually talk about uh, the uh, lack of cooperation from chimpanzees. And so of course, they're relatively different than uh, children who we already protect. Although, notice how recent that protection is, right? I mean, that's a 20th century phenomenon, right? I mean, we were, we were using children in research protocols that we would regard as unethical well into the 60s in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, do yes. keep in mind that that also yeah. is a very recent protocol. What I'm, what I'm arguing for again here is a natural and logical extension of what's already in place, particularly with the collapse and failure of anthropocentric speciesism. Now, for the PRT examples, Think of taking uh, genital swabs or, or blood, blood samples from, from these animals. You get them to play with the needles first, for instance. Um, and then you actually reward them when you puncture their skin. And then you reward them as you're drawing blood. And this is the sort of stuff already in play. It's not that positive reinforcement treatment isn't already in play in a number of laboratory contexts. It is. Uh, I just think that we need to actually more carefully scrutinize the way it's being used, particularly when the animals are in a recurrent behavioral context dissenting from a from that's going to have to be the right. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, Peter, so much.